Hey, Grace, we are excited to offer to you something a little different than what we have been doing during the midweek. We're calling this series Candid Conversations, where Matthew and I take some time and interview some amazing leaders about the current epidemic that we find ourselves in. We're going to address some hot topics of COVID-19, some uh, questions we're going to do our best to answer. We brought in some big guns that are way smarter than us, <laughs> have some wisdom, and so I think you will enjoy and be encouraged and informed with these conversations. Watch these Candid Conversations. Well, greetings, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to a candid conversation with Matthew and Sabrina. We are excited to be able to share uh, some thoughts with you in light of all that's going on. And uh, our goal today is to bring some biblical perspective, some truth, as well as some common sense uh, <laughs> thinking to all that's happening yeah. in our world around us that's actually changing rapidly. And so we're uh, excited to have today with us Pastor Steve Riggle, who is, he's not just our pastor and overseer, but uh, he is pastor of Grace Woodlands. He's the founder of Grace Church in Houston, Texas, as well as the president of Grace International, which is a worldwide ministry and fellowship of churches. Uh, he's known for speaking out for truth. And uh, what I love and appreciate about Pastor Steve is that uh, he's not politically correct. So this will be a fun <laughs> conversation today. And our goal is just to have some candid, open, off the record, I guess, conversation about uh, <laughs> Off all the that's record going with on. everyone to see <laughs> so anyways thank you pastor steve for being here with us today all the way from the woodland texas it's good to have you i'm glad to be with you we're excited to hear your thoughts in light of all that's going on obviously texas is a different world the great country of texas <laughs> is uh different and ahead of us in many ways in terms of moving forward versus california and um uh, we, uh, we, uh, one, can you just take a few moments and share, you've been around the block a few times. Uh, you have, uh, been through crisis before you've seen, um, cultural, um, I'm looking for the word here, not necessarily struggles, but challenges. And uh, you have, this is not your first rodeo. Can you give us just kind of your assessment, your perspective of, where are things at right now? What what is what's going on in your mind regarding what's happening culturally in the Church of America, and in the midst of COVID nineteen? Can we hear from your amazing perspective? Well, I don't know if my perspective is amazing, but I'll I'll give you whatever it is. Uh, well, it's certainly an interesting time, uh, and uh, obviously, this is a uh, anytime you have what is labeled a pandemic, that's a problem, uh, not only for us, but for the world. It has uh, surprised me some of the reaction, uh, particularly in areas that are not even affected by this. That, so, so when you look at, uh, I think hindsight, in hindsight, uh, there, there probably were some better ways to, uh, to handle uh, what we've gone through. Um, it's probably the only time that I'm aware of, uh, that at least in my lifetime, that I've ever seen uh, the healthy quarantined and uh, instead of those who are at risk or sick. Seems to me it would make more common sense to have dealt with right up front what we knew were the, um, uh, the actual people at risk. But uh, um, pretty amazing, probably never again in your lifetime. Uh, will you ever see the greatest economy on the face of the earth shattered in six weeks? Um, it's unbelievable, actually. I so, hope that we never see that again. That has been amazing how quickly that fell to its knees. Well, and, uh, and we have yet to see the fallout from that. You know, while, while people are still pretty panicked about COVID, at least some, uh, uh, there's way, way, way more people out of work, uh, without hope, wondering what their future is going to be. Business people uh, failing, even significant businesses, not just filing for bankruptcy, where they can reorganize, but but, but businesses that are actually they're just shutting down across the country. Yeah, and uh, and and that wave is probably just beginning. So we have uh, we have a whole lot more.
probably to walk through than we've seen to this point. We, we recently did a poll in our church, kind of a survey. It was, it was enlightening to hear how people are doing and uh, locally within North County, San Diego. Uh, as of a number of days ago, we were upwards of 22 to 25 percent of our congregation that were out of work, unemployed. Many were concerned that they wouldn't be able to go back to work, that their businesses or jobs would be permanently ended. And we're seeing that as an in the aftermath of coronavirus, some worse side effects. I think there was just a survey that, or not a survey, but a report that came out recently. Some California doctors, they're talking about how the suicide rate has actually been taking more lives in California than coronavirus has mm -hmm. in this season. So we had a period of time, I don't know what the, the, the stats are recently, but we went through the same pretty much shutdown. Our our county judge, which uh, in Texas, that's, um, it's, it's not a court, it's not a court judge, but it's like the mayor of the county. Uh, he, he not only shut the county down, it just as a reaction. I actually spoke with him uh, two days before and he assured me he was not going to do that. He wasn't going to react to the major Houston counties and because we didn't have hardly anything happening in Montgomery County. And, uh, but he just, decided to do it, the county health department had given him statistics that were uh, so far beyond the realm of reason that it seemed to me you would have at least stopped to say, are you sure? And how do you know that? I mean, you know, is there, what are you basing that on? Mm -hmm. So he shut everything down, including put, put a curfew on. Now, so I know him. So I asked him, I said, so what does the curfew have to do with the coronavirus? Like, do the, do they, do the coronas come out in the middle of the night if you walk outside your door and jump on you? Or, you know, what good does it do? Two days ago, you said the people in Montgomery County were doing great. What happened in two days that now you're going to lock people in their house, you're going to fine them $1,000, you're going to put them in jail for 180 days. Uh, what happened to that? And the thing is, uh, so when you have something like this, fear, when particularly people in charge, when they, when they begin to panic, they make decisions that, that many times are terrible decisions. And so uh, he did that and, and all of these other things. In, a, in, a, in the same number of days that we had five deaths with the coronavirus, we had 15 suicides, the same number of days in Montgomery County. So you, you never saw the 15 suicide statistic in the papers, because you know they happen one at a time. Nobody's out adding them up. The reason I know is that the state rep for our area, for Texas, goes to the church here. I talk to him, if not every day, every other day. Every night he puts out a report. It's all it is is statistics. You can like it, not like it, but it's just the facts. He's not giving you his commentary. It is just the reality. It's amazing how many people don't want to be faced with the facts. Yeah. They want their own version of reality. And uh, so when he's the one who called me, he said, "Hey, Steve, you're you're you, you need to know this." So when he told me, I said. Are you sure? You're positive. He said, I'm absolutely positive. I know this for a fact. So um, uh, suicide, uh, mental health, those kinds of disorders, the, the, those, are, uh, those are growing. But you know, when people become hopeless, they start on a downward spiral. And that's the reason the church is really, really essential. Absolutely. And I don't think the church over a Zoom call like we're doing right here. You can't hug the Zoom call. No. You, 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 uh, I, though this is as close to, re, to actual reality as you'll get without having it. But there's something about in the, in the presence of another person that if you, if you need ministry, uh, you don't, you don't want to be watching a screen. You want the doctor standing in front of you. You want to be there. You want to kind of read him. You want to know. And so the, the church, remember the church is a faith community. 
It's a faith community. That means it requires, if we really have a faith community, it requires us. Not, not at a distance, it requires us. The New Testament pattern is always um, uh, people together. To, there was something about their being together, all in one accord. And Jesus made it, or uh, the, the scripture makes it clear. When Jesus said he'd build his church, he was talking about a community of people. Hebrews makes it really clear. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, even the more so as you see the day approaching. Why? Well, because the approaching day, which is the end of the age, it, it, it produces uncertainty. It produces fear. It produces wondering. It has, if the Bible prophecies are correct, and everyone's correct so far, um, when you see the, the, the Bible says even creation groaning and travailing, and so the, the, the people's worlds are being turned upside down, much like what you see in the middle of a pandemic. Yes. And, and there's something about being together that produces strength. So it's important. Just as important as the physical food at the grocery store is somebody's spiritual food, which affects their mental health, their emotional well-being, and, uh, and obviously their spiritual need. Well, that's been the interesting thing through this, especially in California, and I know this would apply to many other states as well. It's been the view of many governors that the church isn't essential, and I think that's caused some pushback from the Christian community and leaders in the faith of, hey, wait a minute, the church is it's not just essential, it's necessity to begin to step in and meet some of these, not just physical needs of helping people, but emotional needs, spiritual needs, relational needs, where that's kind of the second wave that we're seeing come in of people. The aftermath of COVID-19 is not just the virus, but could even be worse and how it's affecting people in these other areas, which the church can meet those needs and help people, in my opinion, better than anybody and so a lot of uh, churches are feeling like their hands are being tied when it comes to being actually helping the community. We, uh, we are obviously in California joining with thousands of churches that are saying, you know what, we, we're going to move forward. It's time to move forward. We, we originally were saying, okay, president, we're, we're going to do what, our, what we can and help to flatten the curve and the initial couple stages that he requested, we were all on board because we want to do whatever we can to help. Uh, but many churches now are saying, you know what, it's time. It's not just a biblical responsibility, but constitutionally, we feel we have every right to move forward. And so what we're seeing now is kind of some pushback of, is it loving? Because some are saying it's not loving. It's not loving to open your doors. It's, and it's, it's not loving and it's not lawful. I'd love to hear you speak into those two questions and address, is it unloving for the church to reassemble and regather? And is it unlawful? Well, it's unloving for the church to not be open and be doing what it's called to do. And that is healing the hurts of people. It's unloving for the church to not do that. And the ministry of the church, uh, uh, those who lead that, should not be uh, judging whether they do what they're called to do based on circumstances and situations. If the church is called to be the church, no matter how horrible the situation is around. If that, if that were not the case, you would not have seen Christians go in where others vacated when there were uh, all kinds of uh, of sicknesses and epidemics and things like that. It was the church, the people of the church who went in and cared for people in spite of the risk and the disease and, and the things that were there. And so uh, I think that, uh, you know, you, when you look at this, you mentioned earlier common sense. Somebody said the most uncommon thing there is, is common sense. And so, um, uh, you, you, you have some people who are, they're totally on the, parent, the side of paranoia. They're so paranoid, they actually wear a mask out all by themselves. There's nobody within five miles of them, and they're wearing a mask. Well, where did they read that? And, and then on, on the other side, you have people who 
just ignore everything and say that nothing exists. Well, we know it does exist, and we know that it is lethal, uh, particularly among a certain group of people. So that group of people, when we opened back up, we said, if you're at risk, uh, you really ought to consider, obviously, if you're sick, you should stay home. If you're in the risk group, you ought to carefully consider whether or not okay, you want to assemble back right now. That's up to you. Uh, the thing is, if somebody's at risk, what they ought to do is take care of themselves. They ought to stay home. Uh, uh, they ought to take all the precautions and everything's necessary. But should that group of people dictate to the, all of the rest of the population, which is almost everybody, almost everyone else, uh, should they say, we're going to shut your whole life down, ruin your business, uh, everything you worked your whole life for, whatever retirement you save, all of those things going to be gone. Uh, and people can say, well, the government, you know, the government's helping us out now. They're, they're giving money. Well, everyone ought to remember that basic math always works. Two plus two is generally always four. Now, you, want, you can make it three if you want, and you can make it five, but at the end of the day, I promise you it's going to come out to be four because that's what two plus two equals. So when you pump money in trillions like this, which has never been done before, when you pump money into the economy like we're doing right now, almost certainly, unless something happens that has never happened before, you get inflation. So that means that, means that sooner or later, you take all these plants that haven't been making anything and um, now a lot of money pours into the, to the deal. And there's only 50 things to buy, but there's 200 people who want the 50. People are gonna be willing to pay more than what the price was because there's only 50 available. That's called inflation. And you're going to probably see that. You already are. You already are. If you've gone to the grocery store in just recent weeks, you've seen the basic, uh, commodities that we that are necessary for life, they cost much more money than they cost five, six, seven weeks ago. So people need to understand that uh, you know there is no perfect uh, uh, plan to this. And the other thing I think that's real important for people to uh, pay attention to is that so far every single thing we've been told has been wrong. Every single thing. Every report, every, yeah. every, everything, and some of them have been horribly wrong. Yeah. And if you, or, you know, and if people want to wear a mask, I mean, that's fine with me, whatever. But let's remember that the same people who are telling us to wear a mask are the exact same people up front who told, who told us don't wear a mask. They don't work. In fact, they'll actually, they're worse for you if you do. So my point is, which time were you right? <laughs> then or now? Because it's not like... It's not like you're kind of adjusting. It's like, it's like you were wrong. And so, so you, you know, I, it seems to me, if you're, if you're going to invoke the word science, and everybody's doing it, not only the scientists, but the governors, everybody who wants you to do what they want you to do, they always use the word science. Well, I would, I would challenge everyone who watches this, just go to Webster's Dictionary and look up the definition of science. You might be surprised what it actually means because what science actually means is that there is a confluence of opinions, that those opinions, people who have disagreed have come together. Someone who proposes, they have a hypothesis, they propose something as true, then they have all these dissenting opinions that they welcome the challenge. That's how you get to what you call science. When you can say this is scientific, that means it's been challenged, all of this. So we have a group of people who are using the word science so no one will challenge them. Mm. That actually is not science. Wow. wow. So it, it's... It's really an interesting time. And uh, the other thing, the other thing I'd say is uh, uh, I think people have a, a view of Romans 13 that it's not actually saying. And I think if I was you, Matthew, I would address that.
But let me give you just another view in, in America, because I think it's important for Americans to understand their heritage. Uh, uh, what I've told our church is I've raised the question, who is the king in America? Because Romans 13 is about really the, the power of the king. And I told the church, actually you are. I speak to the church. In fact, I was on a Zoom call with a number of pastors and I addressed the subject. I said, I told them, I said, all of you, you speak to the king in America. You counsel the king every Sunday when you speak. There are all the people sitting out there because this is a constitutional republic. And what that means is that in America, um, as the people, we actually, the, the, those in power work for us. It would be good for some of these governors to actually remember that they work for the people. The people are not their servants. In fact, what you're seeing in all the discontent around the country is that people are fed up with, with these they elected to represent them. Right. Because representative government who are now lording it over them. That's not the way in America ever. And what everyone should remember that in America, uh, we do not have a person, even the president, that person is not the, the final um, arbiter in America. The final arbiter in America is the Constitution of the United States. It starts with three words, we the people. It has a Bill of Rights that were amendments to the Constitution because those who came before us felt like those uh, unalienable rights needed to be defined. And so they did. And the first one basically says the government uh, is not in the business and can't be telling people when, uh, what, or where to worship. It's not the government's business in America because as soon as it becomes the, gov the government's business, we become a government church and they dictate, just like in China in which they will they govern the church and that's why in china it requires an underground church wow. so and and i think everyone else ought to remember this uh, uh, when we talk about our rights people saying should you demand your rights it's not about demanding your rights it's about it's about saying those rights were purchased with the blood of citizens of this country who chose to fight to preserve those rights and far more of those people died than will ever die of this of this virus right here and it's very important for people to remember that when rights are surrendered they are very rarely ever returned and you know we have ministries in 107 nations many of those nations um, are forms of government that would not be democratic. Some of them are in name only. And, the, uh, and somehow at one time, they started down the road of, of true democracy, but a strong man took over. How'd that happen? Created some circumstance or some virus or something like that happened. And in the middle of that, for the people's good, they took those rights away. I would, I would suggest to uh, everyone listening to this that the governor, the president, the mayor, the city council member, their first responsibility is not to protect your health. They did not swear to protect your health. They chose to uphold the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution is that document that has held us together all of these years. And so I would encourage everyone to say uh, it's really important, critically important for the sake of your kids, your grandkids, future generations, and what we owe our parents and our grandparents and the founders of this nation that as we face this crisis right now, uh, we make sure that we are not intimidated uh, by these who 
for whatever reason, are attempting to control our lives. With that, we're not being unwise. We are being responsible. But if you can go to the grocery store, you can certainly go to church. I can promise you that people who are coming here to Grace Woodlands, and we've been open now for five weeks, they are safer in this building than they went to the grocery store because I went there on Saturday. And once I got past the four or five little yellow six foot lines walking in, it was a free for all and there was a ton of people. And the lettuce thing, Ben, is not six feet wide. So if you're gonna get a head of lettuce, you're gonna get it right while somebody's standing right by you. And I had people within two or three feet of me uh, and I, I wanted to yell out, well, are you all, all of you people worried about social distancing? How come you're invading my space here? So you come into to our church, we're, we're observing in Texas, our attorney general and governor, here's what they said to the pastors. We trust you to do the right thing. We're, we're giving some guidance, but we're not issuing any mandates. The guidance was actually written by a group of pastors. I, I was one of those who wrote those. We were on a call. We've had several calls with the governor, lieutenant governor, um, attorney general, uh, put together by Dave Walsh, Houston Pastors Council, Texas Pastor Council. Uh, one of those calls had like uh, 1,200 pastors. The, the, the smallest one has had like 400. So we've had these calls, pastors. One of them, the attorney general is on. And uh, so he's, he, pastors are asking questions and they're asking questions like, uh, well, about this rule, and how do I do this? And he kept saying, well, that's it's really not a rule. This is just guidance. And finally, he said, look, guys, I'm just telling you. I trust you. There are no rules. Do what you think is right and appropriate, because you're going to live with the consequences. There's a novel thought. As Americans, we have freedoms. Yeah. And with the freedoms come some responsibilities. And listen, also there come some risks. That's what freedom is about. The freedom to take the risk that you choose to take. And so uh, it's been amazing to me the number of people who seem so willing to give up their freedom because of a little bit of risk that they might have to take when they take it every day. Yeah. You take it when you drive, you take it when you eat your food. You, I mean, we are taking risks every day and that comes with life. It's, it is interesting that in California, what's deemed essential and what's not in terms of businesses, in terms of personnel that can work. And it's almost like they think that the virus can tell the difference between Home Depot and <laughs> another mom and pop shop, which is, yeah. I, I've been to the stores and touched the same keypads that everybody else touched and <laughs> had the same checker grab my food that just touched everything. It's, it's just interesting how uh, things are playing out and it's, it, a lot of it seems very illogical. And I, I do believe that if anyone cares about people, it's going to be pastors and churches and uh, to keep people safe, to use wisdom, um, and so that's why we've, we've, I think that people need to have common sense. I think people need to understand God's word and God's charge for us to assemble together. I think that there needs to be a civics course that needs to be mandatory for every American now, because it seems like people are forgetting uh, what the constitution is yeah. about. So I, I appreciate that you are in charge with that. And uh, I'm grateful that there are many pastors and not just pastors, but I think we're even seeing business people and regular citizens that are standing up saying, you know what, we are, there's a reason why America is different. And these are liberties that we've been afforded. And it's, it's encouraging to hear people uh, rally together to protect those and it'd be interesting to see how this all plays out and um, excited to see what happens in these days in front of us. Would you, would you mind just taking a few moments as we conclude our time and just, would you pray for our church in Oceanside and pray for Sabrina and I, and I, I want your boldness to uh, be contagious to us and your courage. So thank you. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for being an example for the body of Christ and for us personally. Glad to. Let me say just one other thing before I go. I've lived a while. I can remember when no one no one I even knew 
took their dog in for to be bathed and had a haircut. You you just dogs were dogs and and you know we always had dogs, but our dogs never went to. And yet the pet salons are essential, but the church is not. Marijuana dispensaries are essential, but the church is not. Liquor stores are essential, but the church is not. See, we actually had the liquor stores in Texas. The church was not essential in Texas at first. As good as our governor is, he's a good guy. But the, but the church was not on his list of essential businesses. So uh, I made a video uh, that uh, about 30 some thousand people saw and other people spoke up and we said, um, we'd sure like to be as essential as the liquor store. You know, could we, you know, I mean, facetiously. So finally the governor, he got religion and um, he discovered the church was essential. And we said, thanks a lot. We are, we're now on the level of liquor store. One pastor called me up and said, this isn't a great day. We finally arrived at the level of liquor stores here. Well, here's the, here's the thing. How can any, any person who recognizes and values the church look at that? And those are the, the decisions the governor of California has made and say, the man evidently has no knowledge of what church does. Right. He had, or he has a bias toward the church. He doesn't see them in any value. But he's not speaking for the people of California. The, the people, he's already illustrated that when he was the mayor of San Francisco and California overwhelmingly voted. And he said, I don't care what your vote was. I'll do whatever I want to do. So it's time for the people of California to stand up. That's right. And say, and say, this is our, we have a right to our opinion. We have a right to our rights. We have a right to our freedom. And you don't have a right to take that freedom away from us. And the other thing I would, I would re recommend to people is take a careful look at the statistics because you measure risk. That's what we do naturally. Like you said, in traffic, we know if you go 30 miles an hour, there's going to be far less accidents. You know what hap would happen in Houston, Texas, if you ever went 30 miles an hour on the freeway. Yeah. There'd be five 18-wheelers run over you in the period of about 90 seconds. So, but you measure risk. So what's, what's difficult in this is, is to measure risk because you have information coming from so many sources, and you do that in any crisis. So now we have all this information coming in um, we have other doctors, lots of them, 600 that just sent President Trump a letter that are stating the opposite of what some of the other experts. Some of these doctors have the same exact letters, the credentials after their name as the ones who have given us all this other information. And then you have uh, the people who say, like, like some of the news grabbed on to Texas that we opened up and it's getting really bad because the cases went up. Well, the cases went up because we, we've tested about four times as many people. That You don't look at that, you look at how many people, so if you say, well, how many people are in the hospital? Oh, that didn't go up any. It was exactly what it was. Oh, and deaths, what about deaths? Well, the, the, are the deaths gonna go up a little bit? Yeah, but they're not going up in proportion, and how many of those people uh, got designated as COVID because the hospital's gonna get more money. Exactly. For so it's important for people to look at the statistics and when, when they look at them overall, you're in the point zero, 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 zero something. It, it's, it's really crazy. That's just to get a balanced perspective. That's what we need in the middle of this hour. And here's the thing for the church. It's important for people in the church in the middle of, of crazy times to not be crazy. Good. To, uh, and, and remember that, uh, you know, if you're in the church and and you're ill, you're in the church, and you're at risk, the church, the church is called to take care of you. If you're in the church and you're not at risk, then you're called to do ministry in the middle of this hour. Because ministry happens in the middle of misery. People's lives are messed up and all of that. So that's where the church ought to be rising up. And the only way the church will is if we are not so so consumed with ourselves 
in this time. And if we aren't, God will use us. Since we've opened up, it's amazing the number of people who've come. I, I walked over yesterday in one of the services to a couple staff members, and I said, uh, can you believe all the new people that are here? And one of them said, it's a new church. Oh. It's because there's still a ton of churches that are not open in Texas for whatever reasons, but a lot of it's fear. To me, if we, if we believe that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind, I would say, well, let's use the sound mind. Make sound decisions. That's good. Reach out, touch people in Jesus' name. Let's minister in the middle of this environment. I like and let's see what God will do. Yeah. So, Lord, uh, mm. I pray today for Matthew and Sabrina. Thank you for their leadership, for their courage. Um, I pray for the church in Oceanside. Lord, you have been assembling not just a house, a room full of people. You've been putting together a living, breathing body that is uh, called by your name. And you've been raising these people up. Who knows if it was for a time just like this, that in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of adversity, that you would use the people of grace to minister to many. So I pray today that, uh, that you will raise this congregation uh, as a whole together. You would renew them and put your spirit upon them and you would uh, embolden them, give them courage in the middle of this time and give them a heart of empathy for the many that are suffering. I pray for the, all of the people in the community, all of the uncertainty that's there. Let, uh, let the word that goes from grace be an encouraging, uplifting, sustaining, healing um, word, I pray, in the middle of these uncertain times. And Lord, for all of those within the church who are suffering, all of those who are out of work, those who might be ill, I pray today that you would come and do what you do. Let your word come to life. Become Jehovah Rapha, our healer, and Jehovah Jireh, our provider. And I give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Steve. We love you. We appreciate you. Thank you love for you. your leadership and all that you're doing. We can't wait to have you back in Oceanside with us and back on the, the best coast, the West Coast. <laughs> well, um, be, it, be it, it, the best coach. There you go. I agree with that one. <laughs> All right. Have a great rest of your day and hope to see you soon. Okay. God bless you guys. Bye.